Hey fellow proletarians, members of the revolutionary class, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the May 2021 edition of Socialism for All. And today we're doing an audiobook and discussion of the introduction to a collection called Cooperatives and Socialism, A View from Cuba, edited by Camilla Pinheiro Harnaker. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting us on Patreon. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So uh, the other day I uploaded the first article in this collection. It was called An Introduction to Cooperatives by Jesus Cruz Reyes and Camila Pinheiro Harnaker. And um, I was a little underwhelmed by that article. We're reading a number of articles from this book uh, to get more of a socialist perspective on the worker cooperative movement. Although this book, uh, part of what underwhelmed me about it, was that this book encompasses more than just worker cooperatives. They also get into consumer cooperatives, the value of which I personally feel is very kind of limited. Um, it depends on the context, but as far as worker liberation, it's fairly limited in my view. Anyway, um, having read that and having skimmed through some of the other articles a little more deeply, I wanted to back up and before we went any further, do the introduction which is also written by the editor, Camilla Pinheiro Harnaker, and get into a little bit more of the background of where this collection came from and some of the ideological underpinnings, because it seemed to me that if we as socialists, particularly Marxist-Leninists, as this channel strongly leans in that direction, are trying to critique what's going on, let's say, with a Richard Wolff, and this series uh, that I'm doing on cooperatives, which also encompasses some of the suggested readings from Richard Wolff's webpage, then, you know, getting into those ideological underpinnings is important. Um, I will do as many of these articles as it seems to make sense to do before we plunge more directly into Wolff territory, um, because, you know, for those of us understanding Socialism from the more traditional Marxist-Leninist type perspective of you have a party and a revolution and all that kind of stuff, looking at this kind of uh, let's build a lot of worker cooperatives as many on the left are throwing around, particularly in places like the United States, um, you know, let's be able to do a substantive critique of that and, you know, try to examine their thought process, see what's going on. So, without further ado, let's get into this now. This collection is from 2013. Uh, I think some of the articles are a little older than that, but I'm assuming the introduction is from 2012 or 2013, so pretty recent. Okay, so let's get into the audiobook, The Introduction to Cooperatives and Socialism, A View from Cuba by Camilla Pinheiro Harnaker. This book was the result of an urgent need to make a modest contribution to the successful birth of Cuba's new cooperative movement. When the draft economic and social policy guidelines of the 6th Congress of the Communist Party of Cuba were issued in November 2010, and they mentioned cooperatives as one of the main forms that non-state employment is expected to take, the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Center in Havana asked me to undertake this task. The Spanish version of this book was launched in March 2011, and a second edition is already in print. In the current context, we consider it opportune and necessary to help educate people about a form of self-managed socioeconomic organization whose principles, basic characteristics, and potential are unknown in Cuba and which all signs seem to indicate will play an important role in our new societal model. Although we target Cuban readers, this book may be of interest to anyone who is curious about the changes that are currently taking place here, as well as to those thinking about transforming their economies away from the undemocratic, atomistic, greed-based capitalist relations that predominate today and that, to a great extent, have caused the current global crises. The fact that the United Nations has declared 2012 as the Year of Cooperatives, seeking to promote such alternative socioeconomic organizations, might also raise interest in these topics. To delve into the role that cooperatives could play in a society that seeks to overcome the irrationality and injustice of capitalism is to envision an alternative between efficient self-destruction and unsustainable utopias. 
between free market and authoritarian central planning. When the cooperative production model is proposed in Cuba as a, not the only, form of organizing business administration, it is common to find three concerns in particular. Some believe it is too utopian and therefore inefficient. Others, basing their opinions on previous forms of cooperatives in Cuba, suspect that it will be insufficiently autonomous or, quote, too similar to the state enterprise system, and yet others, accustomed to direct and excessive state control of business activity, reject it as too autonomous and therefore as the seeds of capitalism. Comment, this is, I think, more, probably listeners of this channel are more concerned about this latter thing. Uh, I think for my part, I'm, con you know, would be concerned about that in a country that already has had a socialist revolution and, you know, doesn't want to go back as far as, you know, trying to uh, initiate change in a capitalist country as being too close to capitalism and the market anarchy of capitalism to actually lead to change. Continuing, this book is an attempt to address all of these concerns, although they obviously require much more space to do so adequately. The first concern is addressed to a certain extent with the information provided in Part 1 about the existence and economic activity of cooperatives in the world today. We see that cooperatives are not an unattainable fantasy that disregards the objective and subjective conditions of sustainable economic activity. In fact, experiences with cooperatives in the Basque country, Uruguay, Brazil, Argentina, and Venezuela discussed in Part 3 show that they can be more efficient than capitalist companies, even when taking into account the hegemonic conceptualization of efficiency that ignores externalities or the effects on third parties of all business activity. The efficiency of cooperatives is even greater when considering all of the positive effects inherent to their management model, which may be summed up as the full human development of their members and potentially of the surrounding communities. The democratic abilities and attitudes developed by cooperative members through participating in management can be used in other social spaces and organizations. Moreover, authentic cooperatives avoid some of the worst negative effects, layoffs, pollution, loss of values, generated by companies that are oriented toward maximizing profit instead of toward satisfying the needs of their workers. It is not possible here to analyze the arguments of business administration theorists who hold that cooperatives are inefficient. This criticism generally is based on the fact that democratic decision-making takes time, ignoring the equally true fact that it is the principal source of the advantages of cooperatives over other non-democratic businesses. Cooperatives are also criticized for not resorting to layoffs and for their supposed tendency to low levels of investment as a result of maximizing worker income and an aversion to risk. These types of behaviors, however, are not validated by the practices of the cooperatives analyzed in this book. These cooperatives also demonstrate the advantages of democratically managed businesses in terms of the positive motivation of the workers. The negative incentive of fear of firing is no doubt effective in arousing certain types of behavior, but is not even close to enough. The tendency for capitalist businesses to incorporate democratic management methods suggests that they have indeed understood that participatory decision-making is necessary to achieve the levels of motivation among workers upon which their success depends. So a comment there, um, this is certainly a more conservative, this is criticism from the right kind of thing. Uh, from my own experience in a cooperative, I found that exactly what she was just describing, the uh, positive motivations of being involved in the business, of, you know, of management and also of profit sharing and things like that, those are definitely steps up over the status quo. They are a shift to the left and uh, people who would criticize that as being you know, sort of utopian from a right-wing view, um, you know, those are not concerns that I personally would share. It, it's more in uh, concerns two and three that um, I think we would find our criticism from, you know, a socialist perspective or at least concern. Continuing, we hope that anyone who, taking the Cuban experience as a reference, 
questions the possibility that truly autonomous and democratic cooperatives can exist will have that concern cleared up by part one, which, by explaining what a cooperative is, suggests the fundamental differences between a cooperative and a state enterprise. In a real cooperative, worker participation in management does not depend on an executive board decision for more worker involvement in decision making. Instead, it is a constituent principle cemented in workers' rights, established by the cooperative's internal regulations and exercised via decision-making bodies and procedures designed and approved by the workers themselves. While the degree of autonomy of Cuba's new cooperatives will depend, of course, on an expected general law on cooperatives and related regulations and how these are implemented, the guidelines seem to indicate that they will be given the same self-management powers that characterize them universally, and without which their democratic administration is not possible. We expect the new cooperatives law to resolve the shortcomings of the existing legal framework for agricultural cooperatives, which are analyzed in part four of this book. So commenting on that concern or question, um, for me at least, I would value or prioritize more heavily the existence of a well-run planned state economy then I would be concerned about the autonomy of particular cooperatives at the smaller medium level, which is the level that most cooperatives exist at. They're generally not large scale enterprises, but how you fill out kind of the small and medium sized businesses. Indeed, the cooperative that I was a part of was definitely a small business of like 10 members or fewer. So I think that that in large part probably takes care of itself um, and that when we get to larger sizes of enterprise, that's where more state planning and state control comes into play. Uh, I guess I would have to hear more specifics about what the actual uh, complaints filed under the category of autonomy are. We know from studying anarchism, autonomy is like the, one of the primary values in anarchism, um, which I think we as Marxists would tend to agree um, is not necessarily the greatest value for having a successful endeavor into a socialist economy. Uh, but for anarchists, that actually comes, it seems to me, first above anything else is no hierarchy, high autonomy, etc. Um, to the extent that that promotes instability, I don't like it. Of course, these things are always best analyzed in context. Might I say, I think that that's a weakness of anarchist discourse, without getting too far off, I'm about to come back to the text. But um, what we often see on the Marxist side of things and socialist communist side is the striving for a revolution that can take hold and be sustained over decades and generations permanently. And if you know a firm hand is needed, particularly in the beginning, from the state to reorganize society, then so be it. But the goal is always to free workers from the alienation and exploitation of capitalism and to sustain that. And autonomy is necessarily a part of that. Uh, f feelings of freedom are necessarily part of that. Whereas I feel like with anarchism, it's always about um, those ideals, those abstractions of autonomy, non-hierarchy, etc., whether it works or not, whether it's sustainable or not. So I think that there's often this straw man leveled at Marxists, which is, oh, you tankies just are authoritarian necessarily. It's in your personalities or whatever. Um, and you just want to control people. And it's like, no, we just want to do what is needed to keep the society functioning, which is really easier said than done. And I actually think it's the anarchists who haven't necessarily thought things through in terms of uh, what it takes to sustain that. All right. Anyway, made my little point there, but I think it's relevant. Anytime this word autonomy comes up, um, it's real important to balance that against the fact that you're trying to run a socialist project on a national scale against imperialism which is violent and will put you down at its first opportunity. So anyway, back to the main text. The third concern, 
the idea that cooperatives cannot be a form of socialist business organization because they are too autonomous and therefore irreconcilable with the interests of society, comment, this is what we are just talking about, is the one most addressed in this book. Well, good. Beginning with the first chapter, our aim is to show that real cooperatives operate with a logic diametrically opposed to that of capitalist businesses. Instead of maximizing the individual profits of shareholders, cooperatives are motivated by satisfying their members' needs for human development, which are inevitably linked to the needs of their greater surroundings and of the nation, and even of the, quote, greater human family. Throughout the book, it is suggested that while it may not be possible to involve cooperatives in the national plan or in provincial and municipal development strategies through mechanisms of coercion or imposition, it is possible to reach agreements and coordinate with them so that they orient their activities toward the satisfaction of social needs identified in the planning processes, especially if they are democratic and respond to the interests of the communities that surround them and where their members live. So comment there, and I'll try, you know, after this section to hold comments to a minimum. Um, that is key, and this is why I picked up this textbook, because I would really like to hear a discussion of that, where cooperatives have been implemented heavily in the past in uh, under socialist projects, for example, in Tito's Yugoslavia, um, they've been criticized heavily by other socialists. So I think revisiting this topic is important today, particularly because of, you know, prominent voices like Richard Wolff and others who, you know, not Richard Wolff so much, but a lot of the others saying this um, seem to be allergic to socialism. I d wouldn't put Richard Wolff necessarily in that category, but we see cooperative often coming up not as a path to socialism, but as a substitute for it by social democrats who really just wouldn't, I mean, they don't know Marxism, etc. So it's that cooperative as substitute that primarily, I, you know, I'd like to do this reading to be able to attack and avoid. And if there's a place for cooperatives in socialism, as there is, you know, knowing what that is and being able to articulate that as a counter to these kind of, you know, rose Twitter kind of assertions, then, uh, you know, that is a good thing for all of us in the Marxist camp to be able to address and pull out as needed. Okay, back to the text. To defend the relevance of cooperatives for a socialist project, though, we must begin by specifying what we are talking about when we refer to this form of socioeconomic organization. In part one of this book, Jesus Cruz and I attempt to give the simplest possible definition of a cooperative. To do so, it is important to note that cooperatives worldwide carry out the most diverse economic activities, and a considerable number of people are either cooperative members or benefit directly from their activity. That should not surprise us, considering that self-management and cooperation have existed as long as human beings have. Cooperatives continue to be the most common choice of organization for groups of people who are intent on solving a problem through their own efforts. Quick comment there. We found in our co-op, have you ever done a group project in school? <laughs> so, um, not everyone contributes equally. And not always for, like, the best of reasons. This is a problem. Um, I think one of the, the trends of my comments in this whole thing is the benefits of cooperatives are often highlighted uh, without any discussion of the negative or very passing discussion. Um, cooperatives are hard to run, particularly under capitalism with very little support from larger structures. Uh, so I just found that ironic where she says cooperatives continue to be the most common choice of organization for groups of people who are intent on solving a problem through their own efforts. Sometimes lightning strikes and there's magic and everything just flows smoothly and everybody is happy with everybody else's participation. Um, not always the case, still better than exploitation, but also really worth, a lot of people hear about cooperatives and just see the whole thing through, no pun intended, rose-colored glasses. I would really like to bring it down to earth and just highlight the real world 
uh, issues that you may face if you decide to start a cooperative or convert a business or whatever. Continuing. The difference between a production or workers cooperative, from now on referred to as cooperative because our emphasis is on this type, and other forms of business organization may be seen by analyzing the cooperative principles that have contributed to the success of these organizations since the emergence of the first modern cooperatives, which saw themselves forced to achieve effective management to survive amid the more unbridled monopoly capitalism of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. To the extent that cooperatives have truly implemented these principles in everyday practice, they have been able to use the advantages inherent to this form of socioeconomic organization, those derived essentially from democratic management and that facilitate the articulation of individual and collective interests, common to the group of the cooperative's members, and even, though less axiomatic, the social interests of the communities with which they interact. The practice of these principles is also what helps cooperatives reduce the inevitably corrupting effects of the capitalist environment in which the majority of them have developed. This is an environment which puts individual solutions above collective ones, that hinders the achievement of an atmosphere of equality, generating and reproducing differences in ability and status among the members, that violates the time required for democratic decision-making, that punishes genuine acts of solidarity, that promotes the exploitation of human beings and nature. While this unquestionably restricts the goal of human liberation, of overcoming the obstacles that prevent us from achieving our potential as human beings, which is always latent in genuine cooperatives, this is not an absolute obstacle to them becoming spaces where these principles are exercised and where the values that this practice generates are developed. The experiences of the successful cooperatives presented here demonstrate the economic and ethical political potential of these organizational principles, above all when they are articulated with other cooperatives, surrounding communities, and social organizations, and when they promote laws that lessen existing prejudice toward them in the regulatory frameworks and practice of private and state institutions. Comment. Note to the author, please shorten your sentences. These are extremely hard to read. Continuing. As Julio Gambina and Gabriella Raffanelli suggest, cooperatives should be seen as one of many forms of self-managed social organization that allow us to transcend the capitalist logic of maximizing narrow individual interests. Because it takes no account of human nature and its social and environmental determinants, capitalist, quote, rationality is actually irrational and suicidal. It is a logic that, as long as it permeates everyday life, not only takes us further away from socialist or communist dreams of complete justice, but also leads toward an irreversible break of the dynamic equilibrium of nature on our planet. The rationality that motivates cooperatives, like all other forms of genuine self-management, is the need of a group of people to satisfy common needs and interests. It is based on their recognition that they share collective interests that correspond to some degree to their own individual interests, and that their collective action allows them to satisfy these needs more effectively. This, together with the conviction that all of the cooperative's members are human beings with equal rights and the ability to develop similar or similarly valuable capacities to participate in decision-making, results in democratic management that decides not only who is in charge and how surplus should be used, but also how to organize the production process, what is produced, how, and for whom. This autonomous management by the collective that forms a cooperative, the ability of this group of people to make decisions independently, is the principal reason that historical experiences of socialist construction have rejected the relevance of cooperatives in socialism and have relegated them to agriculture or to marginal spaces in the economy. Some see autonomy as breaking with or ignoring the social interests and strategic objectives expressed in the plan and raise the following questions. Would it be possible to couple an autonomous enterprise with a planned economy? Is it feasible for a cooperative to respond not only to the interests of the group of people that constitute it, but also to social interests? Very good questions indeed. When looked at in terms of absolute autonomy and authoritarian or non-democratic planning, 
in terms of the group interests of a collective unit that are considered in advance as being alien to social interests, then the answer is obviously negative. The authors of this book are convinced that the answer is positive. Here, we argue why we think so, although we cannot respond to every single question about how to achieve this. We should warn that we are not trying to solve a problem that goes back to the very origins of socialist theory. It is a question that is perhaps more conceptual than practical, because there are cases of collective and even private enterprises that meet social needs more effectively, and establish decentralized horizontal relationships that are more socially responsible than some state enterprises. What we are looking at here is the form of organizing the work process in a production unit, not in an entire economic system. How a socialist society should guide the management of its enterprises, or how the fruits of its collective work should be distributed in society, therefore are not issues that we are attempting to address in this initial approach to the question. Okay. Some ideas on these matters, however, are presented throughout the book. The fruits of cooperative work that most interest us here are the human beings themselves, who are produced according to the specific way in which the productive process is organized in their enterprise. The subjects who work as partners in a cooperative, who are motivated to give their best to the success of their enterprises, and potentially to the neighboring communities. What distinguishes an associated worker from a wage worker in a capitalist or state enterprise? According to what we see in the experiences of the cooperatives analyzed in this book, a worker who is part of a genuine producer cooperative, or another self-managed form of production, is truly the owner of his or her enterprise, and feels that to be so. This worker, along with the rest of the collective, participates consciously and actively in making all strategic and administrative decisions, as well as in their implementation and control. What characterizes a cooperative is not the legal ownership of the means of production, facilities, land, and machinery, by the collective or group of people who make up the cooperative, but the fact that the decisions about their utilization are made collectively by all members, either directly or through elected representatives, under the conditions and with the powers that the members decide. So, comment here, I have said this in several other things, this runs counter to what I learned about cooperatives, that it really is about the legal ownership, actually. Um, I'm still waiting to like formally square this up somehow, but not to mention, how are you going to get that control without owning it? It just, anyway, it not only runs counter to what I learned, but it also seems like if you're not in a socialist society that is handing out collective, you know, handing out collective enterprises to people, uh, how are you going to establish that? Some capitalist is going to be like, here, I own it, but you all run it. Like, what is that? Obviously, they're going to take profit. It just doesn't make sense to me. Continuing. For that reason, for Gambina and Raffinelli, the relevance of worker self-management in different forms, especially cooperatives, for socialist construction, depends on the extent to which these serve as a, quote, process of learning about administration that goes beyond the regime of capital. The value of cooperatives, therefore, lies in the nature of their everyday practice, in the social relations of production established among their members, those of associated workers and not wage workers. In these organizations, workers are not forced to renounce, in exchange for a wage, their ability to think, to be creative, or to make decisions, and they exercise these powers through democratic methods, with equal rights and duties. A cooperative does not have bosses or subordinates. Instead, it has an organizational structure and a technical division of labor that have been collectively designed and approved. Comment. That is not strictly speaking true. That may be an ideal that cooperatives strive to do. However, what you see, what I see in this text, to critique this text a little bit, is not just in this article, but in the first one, uh, frequent reference to true cooperatives or, you know, real cooperatives. It's like there's plenty of things that call themselves cooperatives, as they note, that don't do these things. So it says a cooperative does not have bosses or subordinates. It only has a technical division of labor. Well, there are cooperatives that do. So how do you explain that? Anyway, um, 
That said, I mean, what she says about if you do have a fairly horizontally organized cooperative, it really is true. Your day-to-day -day workflow is different. The feeling of alienation is less because you don't have to turn off your brain. It, you know, it's more like you are cooperatively running a business and bringing your whole self. That is really nice. Um, that's definitely not something I would criticize. That is a good thing. Continuing. Cooperatives, therefore, can be powerful weapons of struggle for socialist construction, though they are not the only ones, not sufficient on their own, and not without risks and challenges. So that's an interesting admission there, not sufficient on their own. Um, that, I think, is in contrast to what Richard Wolff says, that for him, the transformation at the micro level of the enterprise is his definition of socialism. So here we have a strong advocate for cooperatives disagreeing with that concept, it would seem. Continuing, they are instruments, perfectible and adaptable, that we should not permit to be disallowed, either by state, oh, my statism, by statist dogma, cringe, or by the perception that only private enterprise works. As Gambina and Raffanelli say, quote, between socialism and cooperativism, a dialectical relation exists, favored or not, by given social and historical conditions. So right there, there is a distinction and actually a dialectical relationship posited between socialism and cooperativism, i.e. not the same thing. The extent to which cooperatives are useful depends on the environment in which they emerge and develop and the relationship they establish within that context. In fact, as seen in the second part of this book, socialist thinkers who have assessed the usefulness of cooperatives for projects of socialist construction have always done so based on the concrete experiences of cooperatives in their times. Humberto Miranda tells us that while Marx and Engels criticized the cooperatives of the mid-19th century for renouncing political struggle and being limiting to meeting the narrow interests of their members. They did recognize their value, above all, that of the production cooperatives, for showing in practice that it is possible to establish the associated labor relations that Marx and Engels believed should characterize a socialist society. Lenin recognized the validity of cooperatives not only during his final days, but also from the start of his revolutionary activity. As reflected in the chapter by Iñaki Gil de San Vicente, Lenin saw in cooperatives, quote, one of the definitive solutions for advancing towards socialism, unquote, because he appreciated the value of associated labor and of democratic practice in the workplace for producing and reproducing human beings with socialist values. Miranda also points out that as Lenin saw it, quote, socialism is the regime of cultured cooperativists. Therefore, one of the fundamental and most pressing tasks of the Soviet state was to promote the conditions for members of cooperatives to become cultured cooperativists who were conscious of the advantages of participating in the management of their enterprises and at the same time were concerned not only about their immediate, narrow interests, but also the social aspects of their individuality. And a comment there, we did do on the channel Lenin's On Cooperation, he talks about this and says we have this huge reactionary mass of peasants or peasants who at least could go reactionary. What are we going to do with them? And the cooperatives were sort of his solution and compromise to that problem. It was a little like running your own business, but it also coincided and was compatible enough with the Bolsheviks vision for transforming the USSR. Always important to consider context and not to treat ideas in isolation. Okay. Che Guevara, for his part, studied the Kolkhoz, the only type of workers' cooperative that existed in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR, in the mid-1960s. Based on his notes on the Soviet Manual of Political Economy, Helen Yaffe concludes that Che saw the Kolkhoz as a more advanced form of organizing labor than the family-based or private agricultural enterprise. The institutional design of the Kolkhoz, however, created internal and external contradictions that prevented the Kolkhoz farms from using the advantages of the cooperative management model. 
Che's critique of the Kolkhoz that is most relevant for socialist construction is that, as Yaffe notes, quote, even if private property within the Kolkhoz were eliminated, there would remain a contradiction between each individual collective ownership and the social ownership of all the people. Therefore, he regarded the Kolkhoz, quote, as introducing a capitalist superstructure into socialist society. In other words, the Kolkhoz promoted the logic of the maximization of narrow individual and collective group benefit instead of the social consciousness that Che considered key to any socialist project. Quote, For Che, the major challenge of socialist transition was precisely how to transform individualized collective property into social property, Yaffe states. Comment. So this is a key distinction here. So you have uh, collectivized micro institutions. In other words, the enterprise as the enterprise is collectivized. So as Che was writing, even if you completely collectivized it perfectly, so there's no private property within that collective, then there is still a clash between the collective and the whole of society. This is the you know, problem of autonomy and everything else is how do you harmonize that? Again, the major challenge is how to transform individualized collective property or individualized collective enterprises into social property. In other words, one society, one economy without contradiction that is completely harmonized. This is, this is a huge question, and I hope that it will get thoughtful treatment. Um, I think it's just so hard to approach topics like this from the cooperative side, from the micro side. Um, I just, that's what I, I th these so far for me are frustrating reads. Um, I have done, the, you know, I started out arguably more on the cooperative side, uh, interested in direct democracy, etc. And what I realized very early on was it's just, you can only see so much from like the ground level trying to view the transformation of society as a whole, that's where things actually happen. And, um, I, you know, making that shift for me is part of why I'm doing this channel now and trying to get more into Marxist-Leninist type thought that considers the entire society. Remember again that Lenin's plan for cooperatives was a compromise to keep the peasants from going back to siding with the big bourgeoisie. Uh, it was not the ideal, most perfected form of, you know, socialism that he could come up with. It was the best that he thought they could do with the situation that they had, which was a very early stage of, I want to say post-revolution, but really they were still fighting the Civil War at that point. I think on cooperation is from 1920. So I said the USSR, but I mean, really, they were still fighting for it at that point. All right, continuing. While Che considered it important to promote workers' participation in management, including the election of their leaders and proposals for solutions to technical problems that arose, he also believed it was indispensable to establish an amount of state control over all enterprises, which was incompatible with the conventional cooperative model of total autonomy. As Yaffe shows in describing the measures Che introduced in the Ministry of Industries, Che was focused on finding organizational variants to enable state property to become truly social property through greater worker participation. In my opinion, it is essential to take into account that Che carried out this effort within a political and ideological context where control over the economy via the state only seemed possible through the state's direct intervention in enterprise management. It was not until the late 1980s and early 1990s that proposals emerged from Marxist economists like Pat Devine, Robin Honnell, and Michael Albert, and more recently, Diane Elson, Fikret Adaman, and others, that defend the possibility of combining high levels of enterprise autonomy with mechanisms for democratic coordination and planning. According to these authors, it is possible for an enterprise to simultaneously establish a democratic decision-making process and horizontal relations of exchange that are not guided by capitalist logic materializing the social property of the enterprise both within and outside of it. 
Moreover, Yaffe suggests, it is important, however, not to impose newer concepts of what a cooperative is on Che's concrete analysis of the Colcos, because it actually did not correspond to many of the above-mentioned principles that define cooperatives. Those cooperative principles, which, according to Miranda and Gil de San Vicente, coincide with the communist vision of Marx, Engels, and Lenin, have now been reappropriated by numerous experiences of cooperatives throughout the world that are seeking to transcend capitalist logic effects on their internal and external relations. Comments. So, this is one of the criticisms of, for example, Mondragon, because it's the most prominent example in the world of a large worker cooperative, is that working in capitalism puts capitalist logic effects on your internal and external relations. So, these are big problems. We also had a big problem in the form of the Soviet Union being destroyed. Never mind that, according to the public referendum that was held on it, 76% of the overall Soviet Union wanted to stay together, and that this was the result of capitalist sabotage in large part. Um, so when do we get these Marxist economists such as Pat Devine, Robert Honnell, Michael Albert? I've not heard of most of these people. It was, quote, not until the late 1980s and early 1990s that we start getting these ideas. So, again, you know, uh, while the USSR obviously needed to do things differently to stay together, they did not succeed in doing that. Um, it, are these proposals things that would have rectified the situation? Or are these proposals, and maybe we will read some of these authors on the channel, were they more of the kind of, you know, cozying up to capitalism that was part of what brought the Soviet Union down? We don't want to make firm judgments on that before we have studied the situation more closely, but noting the timeline certainly gives rise to a couple of research questions going in. Anyway, we've been critiquing cooperatives pretty hard here, and particularly, you know, the last line of the text seeking to transcend capitalist logic effects on their internal and external relations. The same thing can be said, really, I think, of socialist countries, countries trying to build socialism. There is an effect of capitalist logic on their countries. I mean, unless they're 100% self-sufficient and, you know, don't need to trade with any capitalist country, um, which is not the case, then, you know, that's going to happen to some extent. And it is going to have effects. So I don't want to have a double standard here, for example, for people who say, you know, China's doing what it needs to do to stay together while building socialism and then come down super hard on cooperatives. That's not really the drive here. The drive is more I mean, the main critique is, you know, this notion that we're going to co-op our way into socialism. That would at least be my main critique, although there are uh, smaller points as well. But let's get back to the text. This particular aspect of one part of the global cooperative movement, this way of carrying out revolutionary cooperativism, has been influenced by the ideas of more recent socialist thinkers, such as Ishvan Mezaros. Enrique Noves explains how Mezaros has reread Marx and has found that Marx's view of post capitalist society corresponds to what Mezaros calls self managed socialism, which not only concerns itself with distributing material wealth under certain ideas of equity, but also produces that wealth in a way that is qualitatively superior to the capitalist method, such that through self management, everybody has the opportunity to develop fully as human beings. According to Noves, quote, Mezaros defends cooperativism as a possibility for, quote, reattaching the snail to its shell, and in that way resolving to a certain extent the contradiction, unquote, between private property and the social character of labor. Thus, cooperativism as a form of enterprise self-management makes it possible to overcome the alienation of labor that is present not only in private businesses, but also in state enterprises that are managed in an authoritarian way, where worker participation is a mere formality. 
In other words, Mezaros proposes democratic management of the enterprise as a way to begin addressing the senselessness of workers who intervene directly in the production process and lose control over the decision-making related to that process. To be able to entirely solve that contradiction and materialize social property or, quote, overall control of the labor process by the associated producers. It is essential to establish democratic planning processes, above all at the local level, in what Mezaros calls cycles or circuits of production, distribution, and consumption. Therefore, self-management should not be limited to the internal operations of the enterprise, but also should occur at the social level, through procedures that differ depending on the scale and characteristics of the institutions and territories involved, of course. In the third part of this book, the reader will find analyses of current experiences of cooperatives in other countries, which, to a greater or lesser degree, share in this radical vision of overcoming capitalist logic. The cases presented here have been selected to show the different ways that cooperatives can emerge, be organized, and relate to the state. Above all, the focus is on how these cooperatives have implemented the cooperative principle of commitment to the community, which in mainstream spaces has come to be known as, quote, corporate social responsibility, a concept that unquestionably has been appropriated by businesses that have no intention of going beyond the logic of capital and use it to boost their public image and differentiate their products. We begin with a chapter by comment, I don't speak that much Spanish, so I'm sorry if I butcher these names, Laretz Altuna Gabalondo, Estol Loyola Idiaquez, and Eneritz Pagalde Tricio, which analyzes the origins of what today is the biggest cooperative in the world in terms of sales, a good part of which is from industrial activity. The Mondragon Group, or corporation, which is actually an association of more than 100 cooperatives, is the seventh largest business group in Spain. Mondragon emerged in 1956 when four people in war-devastated Spain decided to join together to meet their needs and those of their communities by producing electric stoves. The story of Mondragon likewise demonstrates that the workers of genuine cooperatives really do prioritize investment over their monetary income, are capable of great sacrifice, and are well prepared to develop and implement new technologies. Without neglecting to recognize its economic and social success, Mondragon has been considered as a bulwark of light or apolitical cooperativism, which actually does not seek to transcend capital. This criticism is based above all on the fact that Mondragon uses permanent wage workers and has become a transnational to reduce costs and expand its markets. Comment there. Um, why are you using permanent wage workers? I'd be curious on the details of that, which I don't know. Um, most cooperatives, like the whole logic that I'm familiar with, I helped write bylaws for a cooperative and studied many in the process of doing that. Um, why do you not have a buy-in option for these people? I don't understand that. Anyway, continuing. In 2008, only one-third of its workers were members of its cooperatives. That is, comment, worker owners or, you know, uh, not just wage workers. So, I mean... In a way, it's like having a really big LLC with lots of employees. Anyway, Mondragon has established some 50 production plants in, quote, undeveloped countries, especially in Southeast Asia and Eastern Europe, which do not operate like cooperatives, even though it is claimed that they are encouraged to operate as such to a certain extent. Comment, that sentence is worthless. What does that even mean? Everything is so highly qualified in there. It's like saying genuine cooperatives, as this text does. What does it mean? It's like saying Bobby is a good boy. Jimmy is not a good boy. What does this mean? I mean, it's... Anyway. You know, and as far as them being encouraged to operate as such, to a certain extent. Okay, encouraged how? Are there actual incentives? Are there penalties if they don't? What is this certain extent? Et cetera, et cetera. Maybe, you know, there's more on that in some of the Mondragon articles. One can hope. Continuing. One third of Mondragon's industrial labor is employed and 15% of its income is produced by production plants outside Spain, 
located in those countries as well as in European countries and the United States. As Altoona et al. suggests, Mondragon has concentrated on growing, and with its institutionalization and bureaucratization, both those terms in quotes, it has to a certain extent abandoned the radical principles that its founder, Arismendia Rieta, Rieta, Arismendia Rieta, excuse me, was able to instill in the first generation of Mondragon workers the priority of labor over capital and social transformation within and outside of cooperatives. Evidently, the necessity of subsisting in a capitalist environment has led Mondragon to practically adopt capitalist logic, prioritizing cost-cutting over providing decent employment to Spaniards who are currently unemployed. Profit prevails over meeting needs. Comment, can I just say, why are we talking about this thing? Why are we talking about that? Anyway, continuing. An adequate balance between the economic and social aspects is no doubt an inexorable challenge for cooperatives in a market economy. Even so, Mondragon has continued to exercise social responsibility and has not reduced that to only a commitment to providing work. The cooperatives also contribute 10% of their profits to, quote, social works. However, to the extent that their decision-making processes have become bureaucratized and social needs have become less evident, the impact of this practice has been less effective, both for developing the social consciousness of members and for meeting real needs. Consequently, some Mondragon cooperatives, perhaps influenced by participatory budget experiences in Latin America, recently began combining their social funds and jointly deciding with local communities what to do with those funds, so that the citizens themselves identify their priorities. In this way, they are readopting some of the comarchal, or regional organization goals of the Mondragon cooperatives from 1964 to 1991. Comment, again, note the date, 1991. Despite all of its shortcomings, Mondragon is an irrefutable example of cooperation among cooperatives, which are committed to redistributing another 10% of their profits among themselves so that those that have greater surpluses share with those who have less. Moreover, in times of crisis, the cooperatives that have to reduce operations may relocate their members to other, less affected cooperatives. As a result of these practices, in the more than 50 years of Mondragon's existence, only about six of its cooperatives have had to shut down. The Mondragon experience shows that the success of cooperatives lies in their unity, in using the advantages of cooperation not only within, but among them. As Altuna et al. explains, Mondragon's industrial cooperatives are organized into second-degree cooperatives, or groups, and one-third-degree cooperative, the industrial division. This allows them to coordinate their activities to a large extent by submitting their management and investment plans to the group's approval, respecting the principle of non-competition among each other, prioritizing the acquisition of inputs from each other, establishing joint business services, benefiting from common emergency, investment, and social security funds, and implementing new technologies developed by their own research centers. Quick comment there. So there is some interesting and positive stuff among that. However, what's the catch? Only a third of the people are members. So as far as, you know, relocating members to other less affected cooperatives, that's great if you're a member, less so if you're a wage worker. So it seems like this system still runs on two-thirds exploitation and one-third of, you know, uh, members who actually benefit from this. Is it better than everyone being wage workers? Yeah, but that's not really what we're shooting for. Continuing. Therefore, the analysis of the Mondragon experience suggests that its cooperatives are willing to cede total autonomy over strategic decisions, and even management decisions, if the decision-making goes to democratic bodies, where they can represent their interests, and participate indirectly in those decisions. Income scales the permitted percentage of wage workers, and the criteria for using profits are decided by the Congress of all Mondragon cooperatives. Moreover, the executives of the second and third degree cooperatives participate in the governing council of the grassroots cooperatives. 
without setting out to do so, Mondragon is thus contributing to clarifying the question of whether it is possible to combine enterprise autonomy and planning, so important in debates about socialism. In Uruguay, since 1970, the Federation of Mutual Aid Housing Cooperatives, Federación Uruguaya de Cooperativas de Vivienda por Ayuda Mutua, or FUCVAM, F-U-C-V-A-M, also has been an example of the fact that the strength of cooperatives lies in their unity. As Benjamin Nahum explains, thousands of families grouped into more than 100 cooperatives have been able to build more than 14,000 homes in that country, despite having lost about 15 years during the military dictatorship. Comment, that is something the United States could use. There is an actual housing shortage in the United States. Like Mondragon, the Fukvam shows that cooperatives can be more efficient than capitalist enterprises because they can reduce costs, use the advantages of scale while maintaining adaptability, and rely on a source of motivation that comes only from genuinely democratic management. The efficiency of cooperatives is even greater when considering that they also serve as spaces where people can acquire skills, management, teamwork, and attitudes, self-confidence, solidarity, that they otherwise would not acquire. With more than 40 years of experience, the Fukvam also confirms that cooperatives can be sustainable organizations and that they can constantly be revitalized and correct their course. The Fukvam contrasts with Mondragon because of its activism in Uruguayan and Latin American politics. In particular, it has joined alliances of social organizations that defend the right to housing and demand that the state meet its responsibility by guaranteeing or at least facilitating that right. Nahum tells how the Fukvam emerged and what the keys to its success are. Respect for cooperative organizational principles and values, articulation of resources and interests within the Fukvam, the use of state loans, and being able to count on technical advice, which, instead of taking away leadership from the people, provides them with more leadership tools. Luis Inacio Geiger and Elena Dos Anjos analyze the solidarity economy movement in Brazil, which also has had state support for its development. While only a small number of these solidarity enterprises have been registered officially as cooperatives, their organizational principles and values are essentially the same as those of cooperatives, but perhaps just a bit more flexible. The rapid growth of that sector in Brazil also shows us the advantages provided by the fact that these socioeconomic organizations have the support of public policies that facilitate them with technical and ethical advice, using the valuable capacities of universities, which generally go to waste. Comment, I wonder if they're still getting as much state support now under Bolsonaro. I don't know, genuinely wondering. Geiger and Dos Anjos suggest that the origin and expansion of the concept of the solidarity economy in Brazil is due in part to the rejection of the image that cooperatives have had in Brazil. The majority of these are associations of private businesses that only call themselves cooperatives to benefit from preferential state support. The solidarity economy is emerging to return to democratic emancipatory values, including the internal and external solidarity that should characterize cooperatives. Geiger and Dos Anjos find evidence that the practice of self-managed enterprises like cooperatives promotes equality in seeking for their members to contribute the same work for similar income and in eradicating discrimination against those who, because of unfortunate reasons beyond their control like aging, chronic illness, etc., have less of an ability to be productive. Moreover, by emphasizing the local impact of the enterprise, the solidarity economy highlights the importance of the articulation or intertwining of self-managed enterprises and their communities. Another type of self-managed enterprise that has become stronger in Latin America, especially in Argentina, Venezuela, and Brazil, is worker-recovered factories. Comment, there's a very interesting documentary called The Take, I believe it's from 2010, that is all about Argentina. Uh, it's not a glamorous thing. It's like their economy experienced an extreme amount of hardship. Capitalists were just closing factories and kicking everybody out of work. The factories just sat there. Everybody was unemployed. And then they started just taking back 
the factories and running them. And um, I don't know how that has turned out. I haven't checked back in with it since 2021. Uh, but uh, if anybody knows, let us know in the comments. It is an interesting documentary. Continuing. The experience in Argentina, which is evaluated by Andres Ruggeri, shows how it is possible for a group of people who have worked under the authoritarian model of capitalist management to learn almost overnight how to self-organize without bosses, to make decisions themselves and not wait to be told what to do. Although not without their vicissitudes and troubles, 90% of the recovered enterprises that existed in 2004 continued to show in 2010 that it is possible to pull owner-abandoned businesses out of bankruptcy. Ruggeri, or Ruggeri, I apologize, I'm not sure which, analyzes the relationship between recovered factories and the Argentine state, indicating public policies that could be introduced to support a sector that has shown it is more than a source of temporary or interim employment, and that it is possible to reinsert people into the economy, not without major difficulties, who are no longer useful to international capital. Greater links with public institutions, consumers, and other self-managed organizations would allow these enterprises to partly avoid some of the negative impact from the mercantile relations in which they are immersed on the democratic practice and environment of equality and happiness or human development that they are trying to create among their workers. Most recovered factories in Argentina have taken the form of cooperatives. According to Ruggeri, however, the workers' collectives reject the abandonment of direct democracy by traditional cooperatives and prioritize assemblies as decision-making bodies. Almost 90% of them hold weekly or monthly assemblies, while traditional cooperatives generally hold only annual assemblies. So, commenting, um, my cooperative did this bi-weekly, sometimes weekly if we had a lot of projects. So, yeah, um... I mean, I'm a socialist. I believe in these values. Uh, I pushed hard for, you know, some people didn't like the meetings so much, but my perspective that a majority of people, you know, agreed with was, um, you know, we're doing this to have a democratic institution and not have one or two people do everything. So anyway, it's really sad to think of bodies calling themselves cooperatives having only an annual assembly. That's crazy. Continuing. Recovered businesses also have unveiled the myth of the neutrality of technologies, showing in practice that they sometimes make it necessary to establish work procedures and speeds that go against democratic management. Comment C. Engels on authority. They have sought ways to reconcile their values with profitability. Like the other cooperatives analyzed here, recovered enterprises in Argentina do not see the autonomy that should characterize them as a pretext for ignoring the rest of society. In reciprocating the social support that enabled them to legally recover their factories after long conflicts with the owners, the workers' collectives tend to provide services to their communities and to orient their activities towards satisfying the needs of those communities. We could not leave out a look at the experience of cooperatives in Venezuela, another Latin American country that explicitly has set out to direct its project of transformation toward a socialist future and that has experimented with enterprise forms that are neither private nor state. Dario Azzolini explains how the Venezuelan government's discourse and support have moved from the traditional cooperative model to community enterprises, social property at the community level. Public policymakers in Venezuela proved that when cooperatives operate in a market economy, it is not correct to expect them to spontaneously internalize the interests of communities. Yeah. Support for cooperatives is currently maintained, but the creation of enterprises of direct social property, Empresas de Propriedad Social Directa, again, I'm not a big Spanish speaker, some with the legal form of a cooperative, is sought for those products related to basic community needs, so that enterprises will more directly respond to those interests. Attempts have been made to, quote, socialize cooperatives by positioning them more closely with communities, thus helping them to comply with their principle of social responsibility. While policies for promoting self-managed enterprises in Venezuela have not been the best, 
given that they have provided insufficient and ineffective support and have contributed to the waste and diversion of public resources. There are positive aspects that should be taken into account by any government that intends to promote these socioeconomic organizations. In Venezuela, there is confidence in the ability of people to learn self-management, not only through training programs, but above all, also in practice. Venezuelan cooperatives are related to various state enterprises, and to a lesser extent to other forms of self-government or self-management in public administration, the communal councils and the communes. These experiences with cooperatives in the world that claim, to a greater or lesser degree, the revolutionary and emancipatory essence of cooperativism, show that these organizations can be tools, though doubtless insufficient and perfectible, for making progress in overcoming the capitalist logic of maximizing individual benefits and in establishing the socialist logic of meeting the needs of human development while being respectful of nature. Obviously, cooperatives in and of themselves, even when they are part of cooperatives as large as Mondragon, do not have the strength to overcome capitalist logic alone. An overall societal change is necessary. Comment, as I've mentioned before, that was in the first year, the biggest thing that we realized in our co-op was like, what we are trying to do here is more or less incompatible with society, which completely needs to change. Yeah. However, cooperatives and other forms of self-management can serve as invaluable spaces for people to experience in the here and now the social relations that should characterize future post-capitalist society and to reproduce the socialist values that they generate. It is within this context of the development of cooperativism in the world, in its most revolutionary forms of solidarity enterprises, community economy, and social property, that we should rethink the role of cooperatives in the Cuban socialist project. To do so, we must start with an analysis of the current situation of cooperatives in our country. The fourth and last part of the book is devoted to the experiences of cooperatives in Cuba, which have been limited to the agricultural sector. Armando Nova gives us an overview of the cooperative forms that exist today in our country. The credit and services cooperatives, Cooperativas de Credito y Servicios, CCS. The agricultural production cooperatives, Cooperativas de Producción Agropecuaria, CPA. And the basic units of cooperative production, Unidades Básicas de Producción Cooperativa, UBPC. Analyzing their origins and precedents. He systematizes valuable information about their weight in Cuban agriculture and their economic results, demonstrating that they generally have performed better than state enterprises. Those statistics suggest certain worrying situations that cannot be addressed in this compilation, but that deserve our attention. Private farmers, most of them associated with CCSs, seem to be more productive than the CPAs. The latter have shrinking memberships, demonstrating the challenge of new generations taking over, and in recent decades, very few CPAs have been created. It also remains to be assessed whether there has been a cooling of democratic practice in Cuban agricultural cooperatives, democratic practice being an essential aspect that distinguishes them from other enterprise forms. With respect to that, it is important to analyze the degree to which the regulatory framework, both explicit in laws and regulations, and implicit in directives from state institutions, impacts the principle of autonomy that a cooperative requires to be democratically self-managed. The chapter by Avelino Fernandez Peso provides a critical analysis of the current legal framework for agricultural cooperatives, indicating the principles that characterize them as well as their internal and external legal relations. As Fernandez thoroughly argues, Cuban cooperatives have been conceived to a great extent as state enterprises and not as self-managed groups of people. Thus, their real capacity for truly democratic collective management should be analyzed. In other words, their ability to make decisions and to access the resources necessary to implement them. It is in this sense that there is a lot of value in NOVA's recommendations to grant Cuban cooperatives more autonomy, facilitate horizontal relations between them and other actors, and promote second-degree cooperatives. 
In the particular case of the UBPCs, the problem of insufficient autonomy is even more serious. Emilio Rodriguez and Alcides Lopez analyzed the conditions that gave rise to the creation of the UBPCs based on the subdivision of state agricultural enterprises. That, along with the non-observance of cooperative principles, has marked the not very encouraging functioning of this, quote, cooperative form, which was the most widespread before the recent distribution of idle state lands, and which has diminished in number since its emergence. Therefore, the UBPCs demonstrate, although the same could be said about the CPAs and the CCSs, that direct state control over enterprise management is not the most effective way to be in command of the utilization of the nation's productive resources, at least not for these activities, and that cooperatives require at least some autonomy in order to be successful. Nevertheless, the case of the UBPCs is instructive because it consists, according to Rodriguez and Lopez, of a, quote, redesign of state property that combines productive units administered under a management model close to that of the cooperative, on the one hand, with a state enterprise as the decision-making center of the network, on the other. Starting with an analysis of the origin and evolution of the UBPCs, the authors examine the current situation of these organizations and propose an integrated management system that would allow them to most satisfactorily comply with the cooperative character that inspired them. Uh, note to self here, I definitely want to read that article, find out more about the, these different management styles of the Cuban agricultural groups. Uh, I think that would be really just an interesting article to read. The more details that we can get out into the public, thinking about socialism in the capitalist world, about you know the nuts and bolts of managing enterprises in different ways. How does the state do it? How do the cooperatives do it, etc.? I think that that's really beneficial. You know, uh, there are works out there describing, for example, how different industries in the USSR were actually run, uh, what kind of grievance processes workers had what the role of the party was in making decisions, what was the role of groups of workers, etc. And, um, you know, I think it's common to just say uh, anything that's not a cooperative or whatever is, you know, authoritarian state control. Well, it's never black and white. So I think that getting, you know, the sock Dems and Radlibs love their nuance. Well, let's get some actual nuance in there, not just like, you're an authoritarian, you want the state to do it. Well, who is the state, okay? I mean, the state is people. It can be more or less democratic and participatory, but I mean, there are people there. The Communist Party of China, for example, has 90 million members. So those people contribute and participate to at least some degree in party affairs and then, you know, consequently in the administration of various state-controlled things. So... I don't know. I think a lot of times people just think about the government as if it's not people, and it is. There are clearly certain monopolies that the state has on certain kinds of behavior, but they are people. Okay, continuing. Despite the above-mentioned shortcomings, and without overlooking the need to perfect agricultural cooperatives' performance and regulatory environment, all Cuban authors who have contributed to this book defend the need to expand cooperativism to other sectors, but acknowledge the necessity to learn from the experience in agriculture and make sure that mistakes are not repeated. In my opinion, in addition to cooperatives that may emerge spontaneously among people who decide to form them, once that is legally possible, we should also consider promoting the cooperativization of state enterprise units whose activities are not strategic for the provinces and municipalities where they are located or for the nation in general. For strategic activities, other forms of management can be used that truly materialize the participation of workers in decision-making while also allowing, given that they are not counterposed objectives, more direct state intervention that will guarantee that they respond to the social interests established in strategies and plans, such as forms of co-management, workers' councils, or at least autonomous working groups. Thus, a state enterprise, that is, one that is administered by representatives of government ministries or regional, provincial, or municipal governments, will be more effective to the extent that it operates internally like a cooperative 
and that it strengthens its links to productive sectors and to the communities it serves. In what are now state productive units of goods and services that are not considered strategic, workers should be able to decide in a voluntary and informed manner to create cooperatives that lease and or buy the means of production according to what is most convenient for both parties and considering long-term social interests. The effectiveness of the management of these social resources by the collective that comprises the cooperative can be controlled indirectly through responsibilities expressed as determinant clauses in the lease contracts and an appropriate regulatory framework, as well as other measures that safeguard social interests, such as democratic coordination and planning at the local level, social interests that will be defined and controlled more effectively by democratically managed local governments. Therefore, before shutting down a state enterprise unit, it would be advisable to take into account whether its workers are interested in forming a cooperative that would lease the premises and buy or lease other means of production. In that way, both the workers and the state win. The workers would not be left unemployed, and the state, in addition to taking in the corresponding taxes, would not be left with unused productive capacity. Analyzing the experience of recovered factories in other Latin American countries, comment mostly uh, reclaimed from capitalists. In this case, they're actually recovering them from the state. Interesting. Suggests the currently ignored value of the abilities and innovative endeavors of workers. It also points to the most important limitations that recovered enterprises find in attempting self-management suggesting which state institutions can take action to alleviate their problems and thus how to contribute to their success. Similarly, before laying off workers who are involved in, quote, indirect or support activities like security and protection, food service, cleaning and maintenance, administration, sales, etc., that are unquestionably excessively costly for most Cuban state enterprises, it would seem more prudent to make it easier for them perhaps together with those who carry out similar activities in other enterprises, and would meet the same fate, to create cooperatives that provide services to state and non-state enterprises. The measures taken in Venezuela to promote that the state prioritizes the contracting of goods and services with cooperatives, as well as other support policies, can also help us both to identify possible actions and to avoid the errors committed there. The Cuban state can ensure that, as occurs in other countries, non-state enterprises, cooperatives or private, see their relations with the state as something advantageous. State institutions should not demand that cooperatives provide them with services at prices that do not generate the profit margins necessary to reproduce their productive cycles, as occurs now with agricultural cooperatives. Instead, they should implement policies that help cooperatives reduce their costs so that they can offer lower prices. They also should not be charged excessive taxes because in addition to increasing their costs and therefore their prices, it would encourage people to carry out simpler or illegal activities and thus contribute less to the socioeconomic development that Cuba needs. Comment there. Um, it's interesting how they note that in many countries, you know, dealing with the state for contracts and things is seen as advantageous. And they, they want to ensure uh, that process in Cuba. For as much anti-government sentiment as there is in the United States, uh, how many industries just completely thrive off of those contracts? I feel like at some point they're going to just work towards privatizing the U.S. government down to like a singularity that only exists to like hand out money to corporations. Okay, continuing. Instead of reducing the social responsibility of new non-state enterprises to simply contributing taxes, priority should be given to implementing policies that would guide these enterprises toward orienting their activities for directly meeting social needs, such as decent jobs, healthy consumption, the dissemination of clean technologies, environmental protection, and the like. Likewise, to avoid the problem of a concentration of wealth, which explains the high taxes applied to private businesses in Cuba, what should be promoted above all is that the new non-state sector should preferably adopt the cooperative management model, where benefits are distributed equally among the members, 
and should in some way contribute to the surrounding communities. It is worth noting that for the new Cuban cooperatives, not only to be successful, but also to materialize their potentiality for social responsibility, it is necessary to create a propitious regulatory and institutional environment. In the first place, it is urgent to have a general law on cooperatives with its corresponding general rules, as announced in the Communist Party guidelines, as is the case in Venezuela and other countries committed to the social and economic development of their nations. These and other organizations should reflect a commitment on the part of the Cuban state to prioritize cooperatives in relation to other non-state forms that are based on individual work or on the hiring of wage labor. That preference should be materialized in fiscal and credit policies, and, no less importantly, in governmental preferential contracting with cooperatives. To ensure that any cooperatives, formed, comply with their principles and are not fronts for conventional businesses that only seek to take advantage of the preference that they enjoy, it is vital to create an oversight institution. That institution, decentralized in provinces and municipalities, also would be a very useful tool to promote education about cooperativism and assist in the creation of cooperatives, as well as to facilitate their integration with each other and their relations with state institutions. The importance of having a policy for education on cooperatives also should not be underestimated. If a desire really exists to promote the expansion of these organizations in Cuba, then the education system, non-formal channels, and the mass media should play a fundamental role in educating Cubans about their special characteristics and advantages. Moreover, to promote the materialization of cooperatives as genuine social property and their compliance with their social responsibility, it is crucial for municipal governments to create spaces where they, and other non-state forms in the area, can participate in designing local strategies, policies, plans, and budgets, so that their potential can be used and so they are motivated to contribute to community development. It also would be advisable for these governments to be responsible for overseeing the operation of wholesale markets to supply the new non-state forms and other actions vital to their success. Comment, <laughs> things like that would make a huge difference in the cooperative movement in Cuba, the U.S., or really anywhere. Um, you know, I think the key is having a government willing to do it. If cooperatives have been able to expand and be successful in the world, all the more reason for them to do so in Cuba, because they would have people who are better prepared to democratically manage their enterprises with relatively high levels of education, self-confidence, equality, and solidarity, and in many areas who are already participating in informal self-management processes. Also, having a state that would favor the cooperative sector, that would accompany it and guide it without impositions, would give Cuban cooperatives an advantage that others are demanding elsewhere in the world. The consolidation and expansion of cooperatives in Cuba would allow us to increase enterprise productivity and cut state expenditures, while avoiding the concentration of the means of production and increased inequality that will certainly happen if private enterprises gain strength. By joining and cooperating with others, cooperatives are better prepared to achieve optimal economies of scale while maintaining organizational flexibility. The employment provided by these organizations will be more stable and dignifying since members will have the opportunity to develop their capacities for self-management and provide for themselves. Also, cooperatives will be easier to supervise and to orient toward the satisfaction of community needs in more direct ways than just tax contributions. While the cooperative management model unquestionably is not the only way to organize business activity, nor the most appropriate for all economic activities, and depends on the concurrence of the wishes of a group of people willing to work as a team and to make decisions consensually. Comment. Those are a lot of ifs and conditions. I highlighted this, I believe, earlier in this file. It was either this one or the last one, where it's hard to set up a co-op, particularly in a place like the United States. So let's run that list back again. 
While the cooperative management model unquestionably is not the only way to organize business activity, nor the most appropriate for all industries or activities, and depends on the concurrence of the wishes of a group of people willing to work as a team and to make decisions consensually, it is based on precepts that are essential to any socialist project. The relations of associated labor that are established among the members of cooperatives and the positive effects of that form of democratic management are indispensable, while not sufficient, for advancing toward a society where association, cooperation, and solidarity predominate. If what defines socialism is the predominance of social property in the form of freely associated labor guided by a plan that responds to social interests, and not just redistribution of material wealth, then cooperatives and to the extent that the conditions for them to carry out their social commitment are created, are not a transitional but a constitutional enterprise form for any socialist project. If, all in all, the point is to achieve people's active participation as an essential means for satisfying people's needs for overall development, then cooperatives are a prefiguration of the future in the present. They allow us to promote the democratic abilities and attitudes creativity, and solidarity-based values upon which any socialist project is based without neglecting the economic determinants upon which its sustainability depends. Therefore, it is important for Cubans to embrace cooperatives and self-managed enterprises in general, not only as instruments for increasing productivity, but also as a consubstantial part of the socialist future that we refuse to renounce. So that's the end of the main text there. Um, There are a number of footnotes which I didn't read. Now reaching them, uh, I want to read two of them. So the first footnote is, by autonomy, I had commented on this earlier, by autonomy, we mean the ability to make decisions independently. As we will see, no form of social organization in the world is completely autonomous because its choices are determined in some degree by its environment commenting that's a good point um so okay if no organization really is independent and you know capitalism in fact uh you know the wild west market anarchy aspect of capitalism is all kinds of businesses acting quote independently they're not really coordinating with any other businesses that's exactly what we're trying to get away from so what is the level of autonomy that is desirable and why you know, anarchists will put, you know, no hierarchy and autonomy among their first values, like for their own sake. But, but why, you know, why do we want these things? Um, If we recognize that we are interdependent, and all of our choices come out of our environment, and if you dig into the individual, you're going to find the individual socialization, you're going to actually find the society within the individual, uh, to a large extent, well, you know, how much autonomy and, and why? You know, I, I think that it's, it's a valid discussion to have, but uh, not just taking it for granted would be a step forward. The second note I want to read is on the human development. So, quoting, I use the term full or overall, quote, human development to clarify that I oppose the progressivist and economicist mythology that reduces development to an abundance of material goods without taking into account that development also has its ethical and spiritual aspects where people can fulfill themselves professionally and as human beings with a social nature. So in the cooperative that I participated in, this was a major thing. Even when people were mopping floors or serving customers or whatever, we, um, you know, had we prioritized dignity and uh, people being able to balance, you know, doing menial tasks with, um, you know, doing higher level tasks that, you know, develop your intellect a little bit more and things like that. The way that the capitalist economy is set up, you have some jobs that are just like 100% demeaning, degrading, dirty, disgusting work. And then some jobs that are 100% wearing nice clothing, going to business lunches and dinners, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, We don't need to divide up 
work that way. We can make individual jobs with more of a mix, you know, share the burden of gross work that nobody wants to do. Anyway, we're at about an hour and a half, so I'm going to leave it here. I think that this introduction to this book is a good overview of the articles and also contains a lot of interesting ideas on its own. Uh, We will continue as we go through this series on cooperatives. I have several more things planned before we get a little deeper into Richard Wolff himself. Um, You know, there's good and bad here. We'll keep digging into both. So with that, thanks to our current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to make a donation and get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month. If that's not your thing, liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting also help anywhere that you can distribute this video, particularly into socialist, communist, leftist groups on Facebook. We currently have no formal presence there, having been kicked off several times and just haven't gotten sick of it. So uh, that is helpful and gets these videos in front of a whole lot of left-leaning eyes. Thanks for all that you do, and we will catch you in the next video.